把时间交给执行长，请掌声欢迎。Okay. Good morning. Thank you, everyone, to be in here.、Uh, this session is critical internet resources、uh, from technical and operation perspective to, to discuss the potential issue and threat to the internet critical internet resources. And today we have three panelists.、Uh, one is、uh, AP. One is Paul Wilson,、uh, APNIC Director General. Paul Wilson. The second one is Fred Becker. Uh, he is a board member for Internet System Consortium.、Uh, the last one is Paul Vixi.、Uh, Paul Vixi also was previous chair for ISC. And right now,、uh, I would like to,、uh, starting from Paul Wilson, to give a short speech.、Uh, Paul, it's your turn. Can、I'm、very happy to be here. Are we doing、uh, short self introductions now, or are we doing、uh, the,、uh, the main presentation? Very happy to be here with you for the、um, uh, Taiwan、uh, IGF meeting.、It、really, is an honour, and,、uh, and I hope that、um, what I have to say about about internet, critical internet resources here this afternoon, will be uh, quite uh, useful to you.、Uh, I'm going to give,、uh, as as、uh, requested, a summary of、uh, how uh, internet critical internet resources、um, appear from the Perspective of the Internet Address Registry. So, what we're really talking about here is the is the IP address,、uh, the Internet Protocol address, which is the fundamental Internet address on the internet, and that's、um, that's the number, the numeric address that every device that is、uh, connected to the internet has got to have. So, this goes way back to、uh, the IETF standard, which defines the Internet Protocol, being uh, IRC. Uh, 791 back in 1981, and that's where IPv4 was was defined as the addressing mechanism for the internet. And, and IPv4 address is、uh, is a 32-bit number, so it、um, that provides you with what seemed to be a large number of addresses when it was first designed, four billion addresses. But of course, for today's internet, it is not enough addresses. And so one of the things that I'll be talking about here is not only the IP address, but the Transition from IPv4 to IPv6, which I think most people in、um, in Taiwan would be aware of.、Uh, I hope most people in this、uh, in this meeting would be aware of that. In fact,、uh, Taiwan is、uh, is progressing very positively and very well on the transition from IPv4 to IPv6. So I, I hope it would not be a、um, a,、uh, a new thing to anyone here. But in talking about IP addresses, there's some、uh, there's an important、uh, thing to distinguish, which is the difference between a, a, an address, as in an email address or a sort of generic internet address like a domain name, and the IP address. So it's、uh, it's often a, a point of confusion between IP addresses and domain names, but they are quite different. We'll be hearing about domain names, I know, from、uh, both Paul Vixi and、um, and from Fred Baker. Uh, an IP address also has nothing to do with intellectual property. I'm glad to say,、uh, but very briefly, what、uh, the distinction between IP addresses and domain names can be seen here, where if you have a network that is connected to the to the internet, then it is、uh, it is connected on the basis of its IP addresses. But in、um, and so in、uh, accessing and connecting that internet that network to the internet, then again based on IP addresses. Uh, what is the process is one of advertising a block of addresses which is held by a by a given internet connected network.、Uh, it's, it's a process of announcing that address space into the internet, having the addresses added to the global routing table, and having traffic、uh, which is destined for your network, therefore being able to reach you. So that is all based on on the use of IP addresses. In this case, IPv4 addresses. And as I said,、um, because what makes an IPv4 address or an IP address a critical internet resource is the fact that you simply can't connect to the internet without having addresses available to you and and being able to use those addresses on your network and your devices. And once you have.、Uh, Put your IP addresses,、uh, advertise your IP address block into the internet. Then, those IP address blocks are circulated through the routing system. The the routes to those blocks are circulated through the routing system, and 
this helps to build up what we'd call a, a, a routing table or in the, in the words of, of current internet uh, protocols, a BGP routing table, which again allows the autonomous systems or the networks on the internet to be able to uh, reach you based on the IP address that you use. So again, without the IP address, you're not able to participate in, uh, in the internet routing system at all. That's what uh, indeed makes the IP address a, a critical resource. Something quite interesting is, uh, is over the years how the, what we call the global routing table, that is the, the full collection of those IP address blocks which are being advertised into the internet, how that uh, routing table has grown. And it, uh, at, at, there have been various sort of cr crisis points or points of doubt uh, where uh, some uncertainty has been raised about whether or not the internet routing system can continue to cope with the growing routing table. But these days, we are approaching 900,000 uh, separate routes to something like 60,000 separate autonomous networks on the internet, and the internet is continuing to, to function quite, uh, quite adequately to manage and to route all of the traffic that belongs to those, um, those networks. So just very briefly to illustrate, as I said, the difference between an IP address and a domain name. The, uh, the domain name system uh, acts like a, a telephone book or an address book for the internet, such that if you're sitting on a computer, for instance, and you want to know how to get to or you want to reach a name, such as the APNIC website, uh, www.apnic.net, the way you do that is, or the way your computer does that, is to consult the DNS, the domain naming system. And the DNS um, responds helpfully with the IP address of the, of the object that you're trying to get according to its name. And at that point, when you have that IP address, then of course you can communicate with that site that you want to reach. And again, uh, once the domain name has been accessed uh, and translated into an IP address, all of the traffic and all of your uh, interaction with the site that you're uh, wanting to reach is, is by uh, IP address. A bit like the telephone book, once you've looked up your name and made your phone call, the, the uh, telephone book is no longer needed as part of your conversation. So I mentioned um, IPv4 addresses are coming to the end of their lifetime. There's, there are very few IP addresses uh, left available for allocation to to new networks. Uh, there are uh, addresses available only on what's a relatively recent advent of an open market for IP addresses. So those who would like to uh, receive IPv4 addresses do have access to those addresses uh, on the market at a price, of course. Uh, but that's only a stopgap uh, measure because the internet continues to grow quickly. Uh, IPv4 addresses will certainly not last and, and are certainly not viable for the long-term uh, growth and stability of the internet. And IPv6 is the successor to IPv4 and it really is the only vi viable option that we have now for healthy growth, growth of the internet uh, into the future. As I mentioned, uh, Taiwan has done uh, very well in recent years in its transition to, to IPv6 and the uh, and the rest of the world is, uh, is moving quite well towards IPv6 as well at, at uh, and I'll show you some statistics of these, um, of the current progress uh, shortly. The problem of course with, uh, with continued use of IPv4 addresses is this called, thing called network address translation because what uh, the only way to connect to the internet if you don't have sufficient IPv4 addresses is, is to go through what's known as a NAT, a network address translation device, which allows uh, uh, multiple computers to share a single uh, network address. But that's been referred to over time as, um, as a kind of a fog on the internet. It's something that does not allow you proper, uh, fully fledged connectivity into the internet. Uh, and so as, a, as an option, it's, a, it's certainly a second best uh, way of connecting to the internet using IPv4. Uh, a, a, an analogy for the way these private addresses and network address translation uh, works is, uh, this is quite an old-fashioned an old analogy, but it's the analogy of the old uh, private uh, telephone exchange system where there's a, a sort of a barrier uh, between your system and the rest of the network, whether it's the internet or the, or the phone network. You're able to make uh, outgoing connections quite easily because you know the, the public address of the place that you're trying to reach. But, but uh, calls coming back the other direction 
uh, connections coming back in the other direction need to go through a kind of an indeterminate uh, protocol. You might, you might, for instance, talk to an operator to get connected to the place that you want to go to, but it's kind of application dependent as to how you would uh, get there. And when we, when we get into the realm of what's called carrier grade uh, network address translation, we really have a very uh, much larger wide-scale problem in terms of the connectivity that these uh, devices have to the internet. And so I think the message that um, is well, well known by now in Taiwan is that um, it has to be IPv6 for the future of the internet, where um, our uh, state of transition into, uh, towards IPv6 is going fairly well. We are, as, the, uh, as this chart shows, this is a chart from Google, which shows the, uh, the use of IPv6 as they see it, and somewhere up towards 33% uh, of all uh, usage on the internet that Google sees is flowing through IPv6. And that's, that's quite healthy. It's a growing trend. Something rather interesting in this graph is just how the IPv6, uh, the, the average IPv6 use utilization has gone up quite considerably with the COVID effect. So since uh, something around January this, or March this year, sometime after January, you see that the, the bottom edge of the uh, of that IPv6 um, usage chart is uh, has risen, uh, and that is that in fact is that bottom edge actually represents the, um, the weekday usage of IPv6, which in the past has been considerably lower than weekend usage, as people have moved to uh, private and home use of the of the internet during the week as well. Then we see IPv6 usage going going up. And so we're heading up towards 33%. We'll be soon past 33% uh, or one in three uh, people on the internet uh, using IPv6, which is very good news. Uh, APNIC uh, has been conducting for many years now an IPv6 capability measurement, and it shows a slightly lower rate, but still above 25% of uh, usage on the internet. This is of end user devices, the devices that we actually measure uh, connecting to uh, our measurement points, uh, something over 25% of those are IPv6 capable these days. So I think um, something about uh, the, the sort of nature of IP addresses as critical infrastructure is, is, um, is interesting if we go back to where it all began. Um, IP addresses were uh, have always been a, a critical central part of the internet's architecture, but back when the internet first began, I think the criticality of them or the, the sense of, of IP addresses as critical was somewhat less. I mean, uh, what they used to say back in uh, 1977, back actually in pre-internet days, but in, uh, in those early ARPANET days, was that if, uh, if you wanted to get some addresses then uh, or some numbers, as they said here, you simply contacted John Postel to receive a number of something that was according to RFC uh, 739. And all of those number assignments went from to wherever they were going to go. They were, they were made from the IANA in, uh, in California out uh, to wherever in the world they wanted to go. Now, in 1983, that's when we adopted IPv4 as the uh, official addressing uh, plan for the internet. And the only thing that changed then was that uh, John Postel was... Uh, started to be assisted by Joyce Reynolds. And so the, uh, the, the next RFC to mention this, RFC 790, said that, again, if you want to have a, an IP address or another number, a, a protocol network address uh, socket or port, then you, you'd be contacting Joyce to receive the number assignment. And those assignments were going from the IANA out to all parts of the world back then in 1983. So, it, so that's how it was for the next 10 years. But anyone who was actually listening to the uh, internet uh, media or internet press, uh, such as it was back in, uh, in the late 80s or 1990, you might remember that, uh, or you would know that back in those days, the, um, the press was full of rumours that the internet was going to stop growing, that we were running out of IP addresses, that... Uh, that we would have to we would have to find another way to to run IP address IP addressing across the internet because the consumption of IP addresses was really going uh, very rapidly. The solution to that back in 1992 was to actually continue to manage IPv4 address space, but to do so more carefully. So 
uh, we had actually a proposal, RFC 1366, back in 1992. This came from Elise Garrick, who until recently was still working with ICANN. Uh, she proposed that, um, that the delegation function for IP addresses should be uh, transferred to organisations operating in the different geographic areas of the world. And uh, that was, at that time, uh, followed quickly by the establishment of two such organisations, the RIPE NCC and APNIC uh, NCC in 92, APNIC in 1993. And from that point on, the function of allocating IP4 addresses was carried out by those RIRs. And what, I, what I'd like to show here is that um, the rate of consumption of IP addresses changed very dramatically at that time. So the bars that you see here up until 1993, the orange bars were the, was the rate of uh, allocation by the IANA at that time which was really a, a huge rate of allocation of, as everyone knew. But once the RIRs were able to start uh, making more careful uh, decisions about allocation of, of addresses, for the next 10 years, the, the allocations that we made collectively still were less than what the IANA had been making. And that, that was at a time when, of course, the internet was uh, growing uh, really rapidly. So I would say that's... Um, a demonstrated success of a change to the global management system of this critical internet uh, resource, and certainly it's something that allowed the internet to keep to keep growing. That um, global routing table that I mentioned earlier, uh, it was also a uh, source of concern back in these days because the uh, the growth of the routing table was projected to be much more rapid than it actually turned out to be until the RARs came along and we're able to flatten that curve again through more um, careful management and through the use of, of classless domain uh, routing, we kept the, uh, the uh, growth of the routing table to be quite limited. And something interesting here is that we actually see the dot-com boom here that, uh, that happened up until about 2001. Uh, we see this was, a, a, at that time, a kind of a point of concern because uh, it might not look like it now, but that was quite a rapid rate of growth at that time. And it was only the dot-com bust uh, in 2001 that uh, kind of re-corrected the, uh, the rate of growth, slowed it down a bit, and, um, and then uh, was able to continue fairly well from that point on. Uh, the, the routing table also shows you the global financial crisis in 2009, and since then, uh, ongoing growth. Something interesting we haven't seen so far is any sign of the COVID crisis in the global routing table. But um, I think one of the interesting things here is that the that the use of the internet has uh, has continued to to boom during COVID times, and that's something we we definitely see in the um, in internet traffic uh, stats and so on. So these regional internet registries, what are they? Well, we are uh, five these days five regional internet address registries. We're membership organisations responsible for allocating and registering IP address space. We're serving five regions of the world in an internet inter, in a industry self-regulatory sort of structure as non-profit, uh, open membership-based organisations. We started, as I've said, in the 1990s, and we regard ourselves as operating in a kind of internet uh, tradition. Something that I think is very important to, to explore and to understand in the context of the IGF, and that's the, the fact that we have had, have had traditionally an open, consensus-based, transparent, and uh, for that matter, a multi-stakeholder mode of operation since uh, we have uh, been operating over the last 25 years or so. The RARs these days are um, engaged not only in the allocation of IP addresses being IPv4 and IPv6 addresses and autonomous system numbers, but also the registration of those address space allocations through the, the registry database interfaces, which traditionally have been who is the same uh, who is that is used by the, by the domain naming system, but also these days in what we call uh, next generation registry services, including uh, RDAP and, uh, and RPKI. Something very important about the RAR functioning is the policy development process through uh, open multi-stakeholder uh, coordination processes which, uh, by which we actually allow our IP address policies to be developed by the community. 
We also provide uh, a lot of uh, training and technical support uh, capacity building for our memberships. In the case of APNIC, for instance, the, the total number of members served by APNIC and by the APNIC NIRs is over 18,000. And so we are, we are serving the, those networks that are actually building and operating the internet throughout the Asia Pacific. And the need for technical support and capacity building is something that we have been engaged with uh, and continue to be engaged with for, for, um, for quite a few years. The, um, the RARs operate, as I've mentioned, through open and transparent processes. I'd like to show you a, an illustration of how, this, um, how the open participation works uh, in the next, in the next uh, couple of slides. Uh, so our, our, our community comes together in an open and transparent and what we call a bottom-up uh, manner where the participants in the community themselves are able to go through an open policy development process to develop the policies by which the RAR manages uh, the IP address resources. And this also is, a, is a, cy a cyclical process, a cycle which starts from a need for a policy through a discussion about policy through consensus processes. And once those policies are uh, implemented by the RARs and by the community, they can be evaluated and that evaluation would sometimes lead to a, to a need for a new policy or a policy adjustment. This is the, the cyclical process which has been going, been going on now for uh, well over uh, two, two decades, best part of 25 years, and through which IP addresses have been managed uh, through, that, through that entire time, through, through a, a period of, of huge growth in the uh, scale and the importance of the, of the internet for the, for the global community. This is where our five uh, regional internet registries are situated today. APNIC is one of them. Uh, we work closely with uh, AFRINIC, RIPE NCC, ARIN and LACNIC, who you see also uh, illustrated on the screen here. And uh, finally, uh, APNIC's vision. What APNIC stands for and the, the reason we do the work we do is towards a global, open, stable and secure internet that serves the entire Asia Pacific community. So I hope that's a helpful uh, overview, uh, as requested, of the um, status of IP addresses as critical internet uh, resources. I'll finish there, but i um, be very happy to uh, enter into uh, discussion as this session goes on. Thank you very much, Kenny. Back to you. Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, we leave all the question and answer to, to the... I'll uh, look very, very carefully on the right-hand side. Now you'll see that these are sorted in order of de decreasing order of density there. Taiwan is the sixth of those. Uh, so, so you people think you're very large in that. Uh, if I look specifically at Asia, there are 19 countries in Asia that uh, Google says are, are fitting large in that. And that uh, on my screen, this is kind of yellowish. Um, Maybe it's the same on yours, but Taiwan is the third largest. And, and uh, here I'm using Paul's numbers, uh, AP Nick Labs numbers, uh, and showing you that. So Taiwan actually figures pretty strongly in the deployment of IPv6. So um, I just thought that was interesting in the context of Paul's talk. Um, Let's see here. Now I'll, I'll switch to um, my own presentation. Uh, it seemed like it was appropriate. Okay, so you asked me to talk about the do domain name system and the, the root server system advisory committee. I chair the root server system advisory committee in ICANN which is the, um, basically represents the collection of root server operators to the ICANN community. And I want to comment on, in, in the previous session, there was a question from the floor about the position of a root, that uh, uh, a root uh, somehow has a special uh, position in the, in, in the root server system. That's actually not true. And as I go through this, um, yeah, I think you'll see what I'm talking about there. Um, so with that, 
let me talk a little bit about the grid server system. Um, now, what is our SAC? Well, we advise the ICANN community and the board on matters related to the operation, administration, security, and integrity of the root server system, uh, which I'll be talking about in a little bit. Um, we put together this talk because uh, some of your friends from across the straits were asking questions about it, and so Kenny asked me to give the same talk here. Now, what do we do? Well. We have 10 different committees, and the Root Server System Advisory Committee is one of those. Uh, it produces an advice documents, uh, primarily to the board, but also to ICANN bodies and anybody else that wants to know about them. They're all on the web, uh, so, so you can access them pretty easily. Um, the con the composition of the Root Server System Advisory Committee at the moment is delegates from the Root Server operators. Uh, that will be changing in a couple of years, and, and I'll talk about that in a bit, but that's, that's what it is at the moment. Um, so a few acronyms that may be important to you. Uh, the Root Server System, we call the RSS. We have Root Servers, which are computers that uh, distribute information, root server operators, which are companies that deploy root servers, and then ver various other names for parts of the root server system as it's evolving. Now, now let me talk a little bit about that history. Um, when the internet was, was first deployed, there was these things called host files, which were distributed by SRI and basically gave names that uh, translated to addresses. And you know, if you want to get to a particular place, this is the address that you should use. That was very quickly discovered to, to not actually work very well and uh, to have scalability problems. And so John went to his friends and, and said, do you have a solution for that? Uh, Paul Macapetros and a few other people designed something called the root server system uh, and the, the, the domain name system. And then John again went to his friends and said, would you please deploy this? And so in various steps, uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, domain name system grew from an initial four systems to, by 1998-13. Now, what happened next was that, um, oh, and, and so this is where we stand right now. We have the root server system, which has about a thousand servers in it. Um, and that would uh, connect you to various top-level domains. .tw is one of those. Um, dot com, dot edu, dot, dot whatever. And then from there to second level domains like example.com and World Wide Web underneath that and so on. Uh, so this gives you the names of the 12 companies that operate the 13, uh, 13 identities in the root server system. Now, Okay, let, let me talk about that for a moment. Um, originally, it was, it was literally four addresses for four individual computers or seven or eventually 13. And eventually, um, people started wondering, basically wondering out loud, what would happen if you took the same address and put it on multiple computers? and which is a technology that we call Anycast. Uh, the people in Japan tried it out within a data center uh, and then ISC, um, which operates effort, um, did that kind of on a global basis. There was some pushback from other companies and then they decided it was a good idea and proceeded to deploy it themselves. Where we're at right now, each of the 12 companies 
uh, deploys an Anycast cloud. And so we actually have, I think it's about 1,100 root servers using 13 addresses and, well, 20, 26 addresses with IPv4 and IPv6 and um, operated by these 12 companies. Now, how does that work? Well, um, the central point of control is with the Internet Assigned Number Authority, which is operated by a subsidiary of ICANN called PTI. And it maintains a database of what are the names and what are the, what are the addresses that would be associated with them. That database is picked up by a small group uh, called the Root Zone Maintainer that happens to be contracted out to VeriSign right now. That, that hasn't always been true, but it is at the moment. They put together the files that we call the Root Zone, and that is now distributed to the root server operators who then distribute it to their, their various root servers worldwide. Um, and uh, from there, the, the information goes to DNS resolvers. When, when you look up a name like you want to go to something.tw, um, then you will go to a resolver. Or the resolver will get the information that it needs from the root servers if, if it doesn't have it in a cache, and then it will uh, respond to the request. Now, <clears throat> How do names get into the Internet Assigned Number Authority? Well, the top-level domain registrations or registrars give that information to the IANA. And so it, uh, that, that comes actually as a change request from the TLD operators, which might be, for example, Taiwan NIC, and are placed in, in the IANA database from there and, and get distributed worldwide. So this gives you, from left to right, kind of a picture of the operation of DNS in the great wide world. We've added some things since then. We added, for example, DNSSEC, which is puts a signature on ideally any, uh, potentially any name, and enables one to be sure that the record that one got was in fact the one that came from IANA or from the TLD in question. Um, if you don't check that, could be anything, but uh, the, the DNS security extensions are there basically to reduce the probability of spoofing or uh, undetected spoofing um, or, or other things like that. I already mentioned Anycast. Uh, Anycast is also something that we use in order to ensure that uh, we can put lots of servers in lots of places. Now, we hear a lot of interesting things about, uh, about the, the root server system and about the Internet. Uh, one observation that we hear frequently is the root servers control where Internet traffic goes. Well, no. Uh, routers control where traffic goes, root servers uh, distribute information about top-level domains. Um, and a concern that has been raised, Mr. Putin has said this about .ru, uh, the, the Russian TLD, and uh, we've heard this question from your friend across the street, that the root server operators could easily remove or change or root zone content, uh, such as taking Russia completely off the air. And, well, no. Um, that's one of the things that DNSSEC gives you, is you can verify that the, that the root zone has not been modified, that the uh, information is, in fact, what came from IANA. Um, and... You can see there are a number of myths that, that go around. Um, and an important one is that ICANN controls the root server operators. Well, they wish. <laughs> um, ICANN enables the root server operators to talk with the rest of the Internet community. 
uh, and the, the root server operators have been around longer than I can. So, uh, no, if anything, we tell, tell I can uh, what to do. But, okay. So now we are going through a process right now. We started this, I think, five or six years ago uh, through a process that we call the root server system evolution. And that is that um, it's a change in the process by which things happen. I mentioned that we came up with a set of companies that are involved because basically John talked to his friends. And well, if we want to ever add or delete one of those companies, um, John isn't around anymore. John, John is not present. So, so that process isn't going to work. So we're in the process now of uh, changing that process so that we can predictively add and drop root server operators and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and we started with a, a workshop in 2014 um, and Steve Crocker uh, in, in 2015 um, Steve, Steve Crocker asked the root server operators, okay, how would we go about that? By what process would we add or drop a root server operator? And we, the RSAC, have been struggling with that for since then. And uh, in, we held a series of workshops in which we basically got together and talked about, talked through each of the different components uh, and ultimately came up with a governance model which we published in a document called RSAC 37. That's RSSAC 037 if somebody wants to go look it up. Uh, and we asked the ICANN community to uh, adopt that, which they did. Uh, now, an important part of that is the principles by which the root server operators operate. Uh, and I list 11 here. I'm not going to read them to you in the interest of time. But, but basically, we need to operate in a predictable fashion and in an ethical fashion um, and deliver the data that Anna gives us. So. Um, these are the principles by which we operate. Now we, in talking about that, we uh, looked at the different responsibilities that we applied to ourselves and came up with a model for how that should work. And part of that was who are our stakeholders? Well, the ICANN community, which is to say almost everyone that uses the internet is certainly part of that. Uh, the IETF and IAB is part of that in the sense that the IETF designs our protocols and has an important comment on our operation and, of course, the, the companies themselves. So, so those are the stakeholders of the root server system. And the model that we came up with was we divided the functions that we perform into five general areas. Uh, we measure the behavior of the, the, inter, the, the root server system and have comments on that. Um, and so we decided, well, gee, part of that is going to be something we call a performance monitoring and measurement function. Um, we needed to look at the information that we get from the PMMS and decide what we're going to do with uh, policy and strategy and that kind of thing. Uh, and so the organization that controls that we call the SAPF, the Strategy, Architecture, and Policy Function, and so on. Um, so these different things together balance to form the governance of the now of the, the root server system. So part of that, of course, is the secretariat function. Secretariat function is those little people that uh, we, we don't really talk about them very much, but actually make things work. Uh, the secretariat in any organization turns out to be a very important functionality. Um, so we have those. 
um, the strategic architecture and policy function uh, I refer to as RSAC Next Generation. It's basically the people that uh, make the necessary decisions in order to control the, the root server system. Um, and then when it comes to a need for some kind of a change, well, we need to be able to identify somebody to add to the list or to remove from the list, uh, which we would do basically for cause. And uh, describe that then as a set of operators. And at that point, then the, the ICANN board would get a uh, recommendation from the designation and removal function. And if they agreed, then they would adopt it and that, that would change the way things work. Um, so the PMNF I mentioned is basically about measurements and performance and that sort of thing. Um, there's a variety of different things that they might be looking at, uh, but they're there. Uh, and of course, there's money involved, so somebody has to handle the money. Now, when we talk about money, uh, what might the money be? Well, we need to keep some money around for emergencies. There's some operations costs. There's the cost that it would take to implement the model, whatever that cost turned out to be. Turns out that an important function at each of the RSOs is research and development. And maybe we do that together and we fund it uh, from, from the financial function. And of course, there's a cost of actually getting here. Um, so when, when we gave this to the ICANN community, we gave it in a set of three recommendations. Uh, we recommend that uh, the RSAC 37 model be implemented uh, and that a, a body be put together to figure out how best to implement it. Um, use that provided methodology to develop the costs and then implement the model. So timeline, we started with the publication of RSAC 37 in June 2018. We're now somewhere in the middle of that. Uh, it's uh, in 2020. And so a governance work group, the people that take that model and uh, figure out how best to implement it are busily figuring that out. And then probably in about a year and a half, uh, we'll start actually uh, the implementation of the new model. So the governance working group, the GWG, is currently active in ICANN and uh, is talking with various people and uh, writing papers and so on and so forth. So they're doing the things that you see on the slide in front of you. If you want more information, you're more than welcome to go look at it. Uh, we have our own web page on the ICANN site. We have some publications, uh, actually I think 49 of them, which you can find in our documents file. We have an FAQ in both English and Chinese that uh, in Mandarin, I believe, that uh, you may, may find useful. There's a way to ask questions of the RSAC, which is you send an email to a certain address. And then uh, as, as far as the management of the root zone, how does that work? Uh, the Internet Assigned Number Authority has, a, has a, a web page up that would allow you to look through that. Um, so thank you very much. That concludes my comments. Um, OK, thank you. Uh, thank you, Frank, okay. uh, for your introduction regarding to Root Server Advisory Committee. And so the last one will be uh, Paul Vixi. I s Paul, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Okay. You can go on. Great. So first, let me uh, thank you for inviting me. I wish I could be there in person, but of course, with the pandemic, travel is uh, out of the question. I have served uh, with Fred Baker 
on the board of Internet Systems Consortium, and I have uh, spent a great deal of, of my professional career working with Paul Wilson during the time that I was on the board of trustees for Aaron, which is a sister organization of APNIC for the North America region. Uh, so it is uh, an honor to sit on this panel with, uh, with my two colleagues. So since this is, oh, let me ask please, can everyone please mute, I'm hearing echo. So um, since this is an internet governance uh, meeting, I wanted to talk about uh, the way that a part of the internet is governed and some changes that are occurring, um, specifically DNS. Um, I wonder, are you seeing my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. All right, thank you, Fred. Very well, so I want to talk about the way that DNS works um, and uh, some changes to the way DNS has worked during my decades with it. Uh, some of you know that I was responsible for um, maintaining BIND for a long time in the 1990s and that I, um, I hired the team who wrote BIND version 9 in the 2000s. Uh, so I, I have a lot of background with uh, DNS, not just with FRoot. And, um, and so I've been watching the development of the DNS field. And uh, I want to sort of share my observations with you uh, because it does bear on choices we will all make and uh, maybe choices we will be unable to make. So on this slide, I've shown the traditional DNS system architecture. Um, there are three protocol agents, and this is um, pretty much still true. So this was true in the mid-1980s when Paul Macapetris uh, designed it, and it is pretty much true now. Uh, some of the details around them have changed, but there are still three, so let me tell you what they are. Um, at the bottom, we have stub resolvers, and this is a piece of software that is it's in your smartphone, it's in your laptop, it's in every server, virtual server. Even routers have this, although they're not normally thought of as DNS protocol speakers, they do ask questions. And uh, Stub Resolver is where the questions come into the DNS system. Um, at the top, we see the authority servers, sometimes called the content servers. Um, this is where the answers come into the system. So for example, the .tw domain operated by TW NIC is, uh, it has a number of authority servers. And Fred Baker was just telling you about the, um, uh, the root zone, uh, which has no letters in it. So it's hard to describe. Sometimes we, we call it the empty string or maybe just dot. Um, but the idea is uh, that it is the parent of .com, .net, .tw, and so on. Um, so every part of the, the DNS hierarchy, in order to be visible, has to have some authority servers. So basically, the questions come in at the bottom, and the answers come in at the top, and they meet in the middle. And the middle box, uh, which I've labeled here the recursive servers, although in Paul Macapetris' original design they were called full resolvers, um, this is where all of the complexity exists in the system. It's where most of the work of DNS security happens. It is where the questions meet the answers. Um, so it's uh, far more lines of code, millions more lines of code are in the middle than are in the top and bottom combined. Um, and that also means that there is a lot of opportunity for innovation. Uh, and sometimes that innovation is controversial and I'll, I'll speak to that. But uh, to give you some character uh, for the system, uh, it has the ability to scale. Um, at the time that the, the DNS was first launched in about 1985-86 time frame, uh, the hosts file that it replaced had a couple thousand entries in it. And the problem with the host file is that every time it changed, um, everybody had to download it again. And that was okay because at that time, computers 
were very few. There were maybe only, you know, a couple thousand computers on the internet. That's why the host file was so short. And they were all very expensive. And every one of those very expensive mini computers and mainframe computers had a uh, operation staff and, um, and they were well kept. Uh, quite a difference from then until now when everybody has a smartphone and most of us don't know how they work. Uh, so um, what that meant was when Maka Petrus was designing this system, he was thinking, okay, so this is the size of the community. It's about, you know, five or 10,000 uh, companies and universities and so forth. Uh, but he had the idea that perhaps it could get much larger. And indeed, it has gotten much larger. There are now billions of connected devices, hundreds of millions of users. Um, and the, the same DNS that was designed in uh, maybe 35 years ago, 40 years ago, is still working today. And uh, we should be very impressed by that. Um, I don't. I can't think of another system design which has survived uh, eight to nine orders of magnitude of growth. And nevertheless, there has been some stress. Um, but first, let me explain some of the political implications of this. The conversations between the bottom and the middle, in other words, from the stub resolver in your smartphone to the recursive server operated possibly by the uh, Wi-Fi provider for this conference, possibly by your telephone company, or perhaps you've chosen a recursive server provider uh, for your own reasons. Maybe you're using OpenDNS or Google or something like that. So the conversation between your stub resolver and the recursive server has personally identifiable information because it knows your IP address. That's the stub resolver. That's your smartphone. Um, and it uh, knows what question you've asked. And so if there is any political sensitivity to the question that you're asking, uh, perhaps you're asking a question that's illegal in the, in the country where you are asking it, uh, then the operator of the recursive server is going to know exactly who it was that asked the illegal question. And so the fact that it is personally identifiable information makes it extremely sensitive. And indeed, over in Europe, under the GDPR, general data protection uh, regulations, uh, it is identified as such. And uh, there's all kinds of rules about the way you cannot data mine PII of this kind in Europe. And I encourage other countries around the world to uh, look into that because it may be an important uh, way that they can protect the safeguard their, their citizens' privacy. Uh, the other thing to notice is that the recursive server has a cache uh, C-A-C-H-E, it's not uh, cash like money, it's cash like a copy of what it has seen recently. And it is that cash that has more than any other single design element been responsible for the success of this system and the ability to scale nine orders of magnitude in growth. Um, so all this really means is that if some stub resolver who shares a recursive server has already asked the question that you wish to ask, then you are going to get a very rapid response because the recursive server is going to give you a copy of the answer that it has already retrieved for some other user of the same server. Um, that may seem like a very simple thing, but it, is, it has profound consequences. And in particular, it means that the only transactions which flow upward from the recursive server to the authority server are what's, what we call a cache miss. Somebody asked a question, the answer wasn't in the cache, the recursive server had to go get it. And as Fred Baker has already explained, that does not always go to the root name servers. The root name servers are very good at telling people where the .tw name servers are, but it doesn't know anything about TW Nick. It's, it's all it sends is a referral telling you, if you want to know about TW Nick .tw, you better go talk to the .tw servers. That's all the root servers do. It's a very simple job. It's important, but simple. Um, and uh, eventually you will uh, learn who the servers are for all the top level domains that you normally uh, do business with. And they will all be in your DNS cache and you will stop talking to the root name server for minutes or hours at a time. 
And that's uh, the, by design. That's the way the system is supposed to work. The root name servers are not supposed to be all that important. Um, and then they have become so because they're an obvious place to point at and ask uh, questions about uh, who runs the Internet. Uh, but in, a, in no technical way are, are they involved in every single transaction. So um, the Internet, as created by uh, Vint Cerf and friends back in 1969 or so, uh, when I was a child, was meant to be a network of networks. That is literally what the word internet means, is it is a network of networks. And the reason it was important is that uh, we were starting to see networks at that time, and they were not uh, able to connect to each other. So when you had a network, what that meant is that you and your computers could then exchange traffic, uh, or maybe you and your partners, or you and your customers, or something like that. But there was no sense in which the networks that people were building uh, were ever expected to connect to each other. And that was the concept of the internet, was a network of networks. And um, everything that was designed in the 1970s and the 1980s, and a lot of what was designed in the 1990s, uh, was around the idea that uh, we had all these networks, and those networks needed a way to find out about each other and to exchange traffic with each other, and sometimes to set up peering links at internet exchanges or you know, or what have you. But everything uh, was based on the idea of a network. In other words, the host was simply part of a network. The user was simply a user of a host in a network. And the first order... Uh, device, the thing that the internet really cared about was not the user, not the host. It was about the network. Uh, that's why NAT was created, as uh, people thought, outside my network, it doesn't matter what address we're using. That's a, that's a private matter for my network. And Fred has explained, and I think uh, Paul Wilson also explained, why the idea of network address translation kind of complicates the, uh, the the overall network design, and that is true. And yet it was a very natural thing for us to evolve at a time that the Internet was defined as a network of networks. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to really uh, press, press upon this point because in this diagram you'll see an IP firewall. And the IP firewall uh, might have a policy, as in this case, where the recursive server that is operated by the network operator is allowed to communicate with the rest of the authority servers around the internet. Um, no other device on the network would be allowed to go outside the local network uh, to speak DNS. They were all expected to speak uh, DNS to the local recursive server, and then it, as sort of a proxy for the entire network, would then act as that network for all purposes related to DNS. Um, and this became extremely important when uh, we commercialized and privatized the Internet because it became necessary to start uh, looking at DNS traffic and find out if it was related to an attack of some kind in order to monitor it or filter it or, or what have you. And again, this was all seen as normal because uh, the network was the thing. Uh, it, was, it never occurred to anyone that some stub resolver might not have uh, confidence in the local operator, and they might prefer to speak DNS directly to the outside world. Uh, that was just, again, that would have been a, a not thought of at all. Um, it has been thought of since then. Let me explain. At that time, uh, commercialization and privatization, what we had is users and applications that were connected somehow through a local area network. Uh, maybe they had a PC. Maybe they had a workstation. Maybe they were using a time-shared computer. Um, and that might be part of a campus. There might be more than one local area network. But eventually, you had to connect to an Internet service provider who would represent your connectivity, the connectivity of your network, to the rest of the Internet. And um, that was adequate. That, uh, that got the job done. That helped us get out of the academic roots of the, uh, the Internet history and into the next stage where everyone in the world could use it and not just sort of uh, people at universities or who had government contractors, government contracts. So um, again, this was not built according to a vision. This is what evolved out of necessity. And it was 
uh, it, it evolved as the minimum requirement. In other words, no one looked at this and said, how do we design for the next 50 years? What they said is, how do we design for the next you know, five months? And um, so there's nothing here that did not need to be there. Uh, however, uh, the evolution continued. Uh, we got two things. Um, and in the next 20 years, those two things have really taken over the, uh, the narrative on DNS. One of them is a content delivery network. And you would know this as uh, something like Akamai, uh, maybe something like Cloudflare. Uh, these are companies who they might have no content of their own, but they are very good at getting connectivity and they are very good at um, managing the connectivity for their customers so that there might be a copy of the customer's data in every metro area on the planet. And that way, if a user asks to see, let's say, www.microsoft.com, uh, well, that's you know that's carried for them by um, Akamai, and Akamai will make sure that the user who looks up that name will get an answer that is very close to that user. And in, in other words, it can give you a different answer if you're in San Francisco than it would give you if it thinks you're in Los Angeles or if it thinks that you're in Taipei. Um, and the content delivery network is, I think, important in some way. I don't think it had to take exactly this, uh, 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 this design approach, but I think something like this was going to be necessary. It would never be possible for, let's say, uh, Netflix to deliver movies or even YouTube to deliver movies if it only had one data center and it had to somehow uh, serve a global customer base from a single data center. And that's why Fred was talking in his presentation about Anycast. Uh, Anycast is how the root name servers manage that problem. But there are other ways to manage it, such as giving a different answer based on where you think the user is coming from. Okay, well, the problem with that is um, you can't tell where the user's DNS request has come from. All you can tell is what recursive name server they were using and where that recursive name server appears to be coming from. And so if you're a CDN and you want to give an answer that is optimal for a Microsoft.com user, uh, then what you have to do is say, well, where did you really come from? Uh, you know, I see that you're using, let's say, Google DNS. That's the thing in the upper right there, the recursive DNS, where you've got maybe a single DNS provider for the whole world, as opposed to having one inside of every campus or one inside of every ISP. Um, you don't know. You can't tell where uh, the user was based on the DNS request source. And so those two ideas, where you would have any cast for recursive DNS, like 8888 or 1111 or 9999, I understand from Paul Wilson that there are 200 more IP addresses available where all four octets will be the same. So you can talk to them about getting one for yourself, because I'm sure all of them will be used for recursive DNS before long. So get yours while they last. Uh, but the idea of the content delivery network and the delivery optimization and the idea of global uh, Anycast DNS did not play well together. These are two different solutions to different problems that um, were not, there was never a single vision for them. And so we eventually added some complexity to the DNS called eDNS client subnet and that's where the recursive server, I'll go back here so you see that, the recursive server <laughs> in the middle can actually attach the stub resolver IP address to the query when the cache miss occurs. So that when you go to the authority server, you're, you're telling it, here's my question, and by the way, here's the IP address of the person who asked it. And that way, it gives the authority server, if it's part of a CDN, an opportunity to give a optimal answer for that question. Now, it doesn't, it's not supposed to give the entire IP address. It's supposed to give only the network part. Um, but from looking at my own root name server traces, I used to be an operator of F root when I was at ISC. I still help operate the C root server for Cogent Communications. And so by looking at the, uh, the queries that come in, I can tell you that most of them have the entire IP address of the end user, other than the ones coming from the, uh, the, the global recursive servers. So there's a lot of bugs and a lot of software out there. They're sending way too much data. 
But EDNS client subnet was a way to bridge the conflict between recursive server being added in the upper right and uh, CDNs being added in the lower right. Uh, so that's, again, the internet is trying to be minimalistic. It's trying to add as little new complexity as possible. And sometimes that means it accidentally adds twice as much complexity as a single vision would have required. All right, so what does this do to the internet, uh, excuse me, the DNS system architecture? Remember I showed you that it was very simple. It had uh, questions coming in at the bottom, answers coming in at the top, and then they, they would meet in the middle. Um, well, it's done this. We now have this. Um, so you still have those three boxes. You still have your firewall. You still have a cache. And uh, my team at various companies, including ISC when I was there, and also now at Farsight Security, the, now that I've left ISC, uh, we have extended this system on the right to include the ability for a recursive server to have policy. In other words, to deliberately lie about the answers to certain questions for reasons that only the recursive server operator would care about. Uh, typically, we use this to block malicious uh, answers. If, if, if you're asking the question, uh, where is the uh, where is this botnet controlled from? What is the C2, the so-called command and control server for a botnet? then you might have policy in your recursive server to just say, let's pretend that doesn't exist because I really don't want bots in my network connecting to their command and control server and thus learning what they should be doing as part of a botnet. Uh, so we added this policy function in 2010, 2011. By nine had it first, but now all of the open source uh, uh, recursive name servers have it including Unbound and uh, Knot and PowerDNS. We also added DNS tap, which was a way for the recursive server operator to look at the transactions passing through their server so that they could be monitored. So maybe find out, again, using the, the botnet example, you might wish to know which of your stub resolvers are asking questions that only an infected computer would ask so that you could go visit those stub resolvers and find out why they are asking those questions. And uh, so this monitoring and this control uh, has been my principal contribution to DNS in the last 10 years. Um, but I wanna say it doesn't matter as much as I wanted it to. And the reason is because we have this thing on the left where we've got an application doing DNS uh, that is now speaking the DNS over HTTP, or really DNS over HTTPS protocol, um, and it is reaching a recursive server that is not the one that's operated by the local network. Um, they're going out to uh, whatever uh, DOH server they choose because their traffic looks just like HTTPS. It looks exactly like web traffic, and so there's no way you can have a firewall that will stop it. And this means that uh, less and less traffic as time goes on is being either witnessed for observation and analysis uh, or subject to policy controls by the local recursive server of that network. Now, I, I don't want to go too deep into this. We only have 20 minutes together. Um, but I want to say that sometimes the local network is a house. Uh, that's occupied by a family, and that family might have, let's say, parents who are the, the local leadership. Maybe the children don't agree with that, but that is uh, some, some, that's how I view things. And it may be that those parents have um, have installed parental controls. Maybe there are certain types of uh, internet activities they do not want the family to be able to do, uh, and there are a lot of different reasons why they might do that, or or ways they might exercise that power. But this uh, this requires that they be in the path that the recursive server they are operating, which presumably is subscribed to some parental control service, uh, has to be able to see what's going on. And it has to be able to alter what is witnessed inside that network. Um, so this is a problem. When we're changing internet governance, in this case, it was the network of that house belonging to that family. That was a network, and that network was part of the internet, which is a network of networks. And um, 
for the operators of that network had policies which are now being uh, ignored. They're now being bypassed through the cooperation between local users or local applications and external DNS providers, neither one of which wants that policy. Uh, you know, it may be that some child wants to bypass the, the parental policy, and it may be that they can find a, um, a partner on the, on the internet outside that is uh, very willing to help them do that for whatever reason. Now, there are a lot of other networks, right? My corporate network at my uh, Farsight Security or Fred's corporate network at ISC also have policy, and uh, they also have responsibility, as I do, for the traffic leaving my network. If I DDoS somebody, if someone on my network is responsible for a DDoS and somebody says, hey, Paul, your network is DDoSing me, I don't get to say, well, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't stop it. It was all DOH. No, no, I'm going to be held responsible for the traffic that emanates from my network, whether or not I could see the DNS traffic. So I'm going to I am now left with responsibility for everything my network does, but without control for everything my network can do. Um, so this is a problem, and it is an internet governance problem. It is changing from a network of networks into a network of end users. In RFC 8890, the Internet Activities Board has declared that the internet is for the end user. Um, they don't believe that it is, it is any more a network of networks. It is a network of end users. And it is apparently now the job of networks to simply allow end users to do whatever they wish. What I want to point out, maybe to inform our Q&A, is that um, I don't have a Wi-Fi chip in my brain. Um, neither do you. Uh, so I don't use the internet. My my brain does not connect to the internet. I connect to the internet through a device, and that device has a manufacturer. Uh, the software that I run, every app, including web browsers, they all have makers, and it is the makers of those devices who will choose uh, what my device does. I get to give it hints about what I want to do next, but how that will be achieved is entirely up to them. For example, the Mozilla Corporation, which uh, used to be a fairly well-respected nonprofit company in California, uh, has decided that in their Firefox browser, they will turn on DOH without permission, and they will select a DOH provider outside of the local network without permission, and that they will tell us after they've done this, here's a pop-up uh, and the pop-up simply says, we've, we've made your internet more secure. If you want to go back to the insecure way, please click on this, this, this uh, undo link. But this is, this is notification after the fact. It's a misleading message. And it, uh, if, if you don't know what it means, then you're just going to get whatever DOH provider they want. And uh, that, that's internet governance. That is a form of internet governance. It's called the rule of the strongest. I'm not a fan. So uh, when this was a network of networks, um, we had a lot of different parties, uh, the user themselves, their applications. We had clients and servers. We had an operator for the local network. We had a near, nearby ISP that was responsible for our connectivity. We had a far end ISP who was responsible for the distant party's connectivity. And then that far end had its own operator and its own servers and its own users, perhaps. And um, as a network of networks, cooperation was required in order for communication to succeed. I've drawn, drawn this as a series of gates. And I wish you to imagine, since I'm terrible at animation, I can't really animate this for you. I want you to imagine that a straight line can pass through all of these gates but if any of these gates is moved out of alignment, then that straight line will not pass. And that was the method by which a network of networks, the internet, governed itself. Now we have this, which is the application and the far end have their own relationship and they do not care and they don't have to care about what any intermediary thinks. 
none of those intermediaries will be able to witness or tamper with or block or remove cooperation, withhold cooperation from. We now have a system of internet governance that um, is all about the web reaching its eyeballs for the purpose of gathering information about what people do and advertising things to them. Um, again, I'm not a fan. I have uh, given a talk much longer than this to audiences uh, like yourselves around the world for the last two years trying to raise awareness about this because I think a lot of people don't understand that uh, there were some important internet governance principles that were upheld by the idea of an internet being a network of networks and that now with uh, the fact that the internet is for the end user as witnessed in RFC 8890 we see that uh, the internet is uh, not a network of networks it is uh, whatever it is that your app wants to do uh, when it is speaking to its mothership. And no no one will be able to stop them or even find out what they're doing. I can uh, think of a lot of ways that could go bad. So um, finally, let me say that there is a, uh, there's a cost to this. Um, if you represent complexity as a fraction, where uh, you have a certain number of technologies out of which you understand some subset, um, and then you add more technologies without, without increasing your understanding, that means your complexity has gone up. Um, and complexity is inversely predicted, or excuse me, complexity inversely predicts your, your risk. In other words, the more complexity you have, the more risk you are subject to. Um, so when we make everything invisible and untouchable to more people, um, we're not making ourselves safer, quite the opposite. Kenny, thank you very much. I return uh, the gavel to you. Okay, thank you, Paul. I believe it's our great pleasure to have uh, three very, very important speakers all together at the same time. They are not only has a great experience in the governance of uh, critical internet resources, and also they have great influence great influence in, the, in ruling the internet. So it's time to open to the floor. I didn't see anyone. <laughs> OK, please go to the mic, say your name and your affiliation to the public. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, Guo Wei Wu. And I come to the microphone to say hello to all my friends, the Paul Wilson and the Paul Vixie and also the Fred Becker. And here is my question. I think the first question is, uh, as we know, the major contribution of the IPv6 traffic in Taiwan. Most of them is because it's a mobile traffic. And if we look at a fixed line, it's not doing that well. Is this is a general case uh, or, you know, in the other country or not? I think this is uh, the first question. And the next question, I'd like to ask the same, is a kind of a, back to the 1999. I remember that is a, one of our friends, I think uh, you all know, there's a, 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 a people, a woman in China in 1999. He's, she said, um, if we can assign a unique IP address to each citizen, then is there is a better way to fight for the cyber crime, you know, uh, in China. In 1999, that is uh, not possible because at the time the people using IPv4, and you know you don't have enough else address space to to do that. But since uh, IPv6 is uh, taking up, is uh, what. <laughs> She say could be true in the future. I think this is a second question. Can I have a one more? <laughs> the one more question actually, I remember actually the Paul you are just talking about, Paul Vixie you just talking about in the last slide and also you're talking in the 
uh, I think it's uh, Nanok uh, last year. You are talking about that is uh, you don't believe the cyber border is uh, the is uh, internet is a uh, borderless uh, because uh, usually the technical community say the internet is borderless is a border. This is because uh, it's very costly and insufficient. And I suppose you visit in Beijing before, some of the government don't care about the cost and they don't care about the sufficient. They really care is control. So if that is a case just like Povix you're talking about, is there will be generated two different cyberspace between that the people build a cyber border and the cyberspace, you know, is a much free open cyberspace, generate a kind of unfair traffic between this cyberspace. And what we can do? Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, basically, go away, raise, just initially say hello to all of you and also raise three questions. Uh, you are free to comment. Is anyone want to go first? Up to you. Paul, do you want to go first for the first question? Uh, I can, yeah. The, the, the reason why uh, mobile networks are um, popular with IPv6, uh, successful with IPv6, is because the mobile devices are new, and uh, you can rely on uh, the vast majority of, of mobile devices being either IPv6 compatible now or being able to be upgraded. So that's there's nothing else about mobile that makes it suitable for IPv6. If you look at it, if you look for a parallel situation, for instance, what you call the greenfield network in fixed line, then it's just as easy to have a an IPv6 network, and we've got several examples of those. One of them, for instance, is in Vietnam. The FPT network in Vietnam was built from the ground up as a fixed line network, IPv6 from the start. They, uh, like the fixed line networks, do, they sourced the CPE, the computer consumer premises equipment, for their customers. So the customer subscriber uh, gets the, the cable modem, and of course they were able to find V6 compatible uh, modems at a good price and, uh, and so that network is, uh, is a fixed network that's, uh, that's almost exclusively IPv6. So there are other examples in the world as well. But the popularity of, of uh, v6 on, uh, on mobiles is, is again because almost every mobile network, LTE network is almost by definition a greenfield network these days. Okay, thank That's you. All. Thanks. And also, Frey and Paul Vici, you are free to come on for the rest of the questions. Thank you. I can go next. So it is, uh, it is true that control is a mixed blessing. Uh, some people see it as a problem. Some people see it as a solution. And, um, and you're right. When I visited in Beijing, and I've spoken about this, um, I have to use the uh, the network behind the Great Firewall, and it uh, I can't reach everything I need to reach, and so I can't stay very long because I have to work, and I can't work if I'm behind that firewall. Um, but I understand that the uh, the Chinese government thinks that it is essential to them achieving their mission of keeping China safe, uh, that they have such a firewall. So I don't think I could ask, could you please uh, make your firewall stop? Uh, could you take it away? They, they would not listen. Um, but I think we should, we should differentiate between an edge network, such as my house with my family, or my company, or Fred's company, or Paul Wilson's company, um, these are networks that only have uh, families. They only have uh, employees. They only have customers. They don't. They're not responsible for providing connectivity to an entire economy. And so, the desire to have a firewall on an edge network is a very different desire than wanting to have one at a national border. 
And so when we talk about whether the cyberspace does have or should have borders, we have to remember that at the edge, they've always had borders. And in the middle, they have almost never had borders other than, uh, for example, the Great Firewall of China. Um, we should not treat these as the same thing and say that both borders are good or both borders are bad. And that's what the DOH change to internet governance will do, is it will say that all borders are bad. And that is a mistake. Thank you. Fred? Well, okay, so the question we're dealing with, uh, and tell me if I get this wrong, uh, you, you want to know whether you can assign an address to an individual and use that to track them? Uh, is that Madam Who's uh, desire? Uh, if I remember in the 1999, you know that Madam Who say, if we can assign the unique IP address to each citizens, is there is a better way to you know combat with us? you know, cybercrime. In 1999, it's impossible, but if the IPv, IPv6 is uh, popular, okay. it's possible, right? Koi, can I translate your question? Uh, is okay. it possible to using IPv6 as a personal identifier system to mm -hmm. identify an individual? Is yeah. that what you mean? Yeah. Okay, back to yeah. Fred Becker. Okay, so, uh, and of course, Man Mahu isn't the only person who came up with that. I, I heard that same question in India, and, and I think it's come up in other places as well. And the thing to recognize is that it's an identifier for an interface on a device. Um, it doesn't identify an individual. So if the individual picks up a different device and starts using it, it's going to have a different address. Um, so to begin with, uh, I, I think the question is malformed. It's, um, the, the address doesn't identify the individual, it identifies an interface on a device. Um, now, could you then say, okay, those addresses that an individual uses could be clustered together as a set and use that now to track the individual in that way? Well, yeah, to a certain degree. Um, if the individual moves from one place to another, the address will change. And, and so um, it, it isn't as simple as that. Um, but you could certainly say that the person is often found at their home or at their office and uh, you know, their place of work, whatever it may be, and therefore you have a distinct probability that the individual would be represented by a certain address, and, and you can certainly do that. Um, now, ask me whether I think that's a good idea. I, I think that that has just a list of ways that it could go wrong. Um, you know, if the address gets assigned to a different person, suddenly, you know, I don't know that something has happened, but I don't know what it is. Uh, so, so I think there's there's a number of dangers in that approach. Uh, Fred, I, 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 I understand your answer. The time is but, up. <laughs> okay. Fred, I, under, I, I understand your answer, but what I mean is really, it's complicated and it's not nature, it's not by design, but it's not possible to do if a government really want to do it. There is my comment, thanks. Okay, thank you. Well, the fact that somebody wants something doesn't make it possible. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, sorry, uh, because uh, we are already running out of time. I apologize for not making it on time. The, traditional, the tradition here is we always have lunch on time. So <laughs> we couldn't have another time for, for another question again. But before I adjourn the session, can I ask all the audience to give you a big hand to all the panelists? We have several thousand participants. <laughs>
Thank you, Paul Wilson. Thank you, Fred Becker. Thank you, Paul Vixie, for attending the section. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, I adjourn the section. Thank you. Thank you.